Okay, Ambrose, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You are all welcome to this uh, session today, this webinar uh, regarding employment uh, taxes, uh, tax taxation of employment income. Uh, permit me to introduce uh, the speaker of today, that is uh, CPA Sarah Chilangat. Uh, Sarah is a tax associate director at Anzen Young. Uh, with over 16 years tax experience at both EY and EURA. She holds a Bachelor of Commerce uh, degree with accounting option of Macquarie University and an advanced diploma in the international tax. She also holds a postgraduate diploma in tax administration and revenue uh, collection. She is a member of the Institute. She is also an affiliate of the Chartered Institute of Taxation of the UK and she is a member of the Institute of Certified Public Accountant and member of the Taxation and Economic uh, Committee of the ICPAU. She has served previously in the Finance and Administration Committee and also the Marketing and Member Services uh, Committee. Sarah has regional experience uh, conducting tax assignments in Rwanda uh, with the Rwanda Revenue Authority and also with the Somalia uh, Revenue Authority. Uh, she, is, uh, she has excellent skills in taxation acquired from both the EY and the URA. And she has also done tax training experience for six years training CPA Uganda advanced tax, uh, paper nine. Those of you who are doing paper nine or have done paper nine, you could have met Sarah. Uh, and also paper six at Matt Abacus Business School. Uh, join me in welcoming Sarah uh, to do her presentation. Just a few words of uh, importance to note uh, please let us try and ensure that any questions that we have are posted on the question on the Q&A section and not on the chat. I repeat, if you have any questions, please post them on the Q&A section and not on the chat section. And secondly, let us observe uh, webinar etiquettes. Uh, let's have our mics on mute unless you must really communicate, but I think basically is the panelists who are going to be communicating. Your questions are posted on the Q&A section and then we will moderate accordingly as we proceed. Uh, Sarah, you are most welcome. Please, uh, you can proceed with your presentation at this stage. Thanks a lot. You're all welcome. Sarah. Okay, thank you very much, CPA Clayton Mwaka, for those kind words. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. I hope you hear me. Let me know if I'm loud enough so that uh, we can move together. Yes, you are loud and clear. We are hearing you. I do hope all the participants are hearing. Thank you. Uh, today we discuss about taxation of employment income. <clears throat> and as you will note, employment income is individual income tax. And most of us here are in employment relationships. And somehow you are affected by this tax. And uh, because of the nature of uh, the nature in which the tax administrators administer this tax through a withholding, it, it becomes very, very indirect in that you, you just end up looking at your net pay every month and uh, you don't really seem to, to want to go and appreciate how the, 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 the net pay was, was, was arrived at. It's important for all of us to, to look at our pay slips and just to be sure that they are computing this tax correctly. So uh, we shall run through this presentation today. And uh, at the end of it all, 
we will be able to get some Q&A. My, my machine is a bit slow to move. Sorry, my machine is refusing to. Uh, do we have someone at the Institute, someone technical to maybe provide some support no. to Sarah? Let me just, maybe I reshare the screen. I stop sharing and. Yeah, yeah. please do that. No yeah. Fun. yeah, okay, thank you. Sarah, you are muted. Sarah, unmute yourself. Are you able to see? We are seeing, but we are not hearing you. Yeah, I have unmuted. Okay. Yes, I, I, have, I have unmuted. Are you, are you on a... Proceed, proceed with the presentation. Okay, so... Um, there was a quote just before this, and uh, my quote was that every transaction in life has a tax consequence, and uh, you will note that life in life, tax is, is something that we really interface every other day. So uh, in my presentation outline, I will look at the introduction and then the scope of tax, uh, we will also look at scope of employment income, as in what constitutes employment income. And uh, we will also look at exempt employment income. Then we shall look at expatriate taxation. And then we will look at general tax risks around employment income and planning. Today. So um, are you able to see slide four? Hello? Hello? Hello, Sarah. Yes, we are on slide four. We are able to see slide okay. four. Please proceed. Yeah, so um, in slide four, we are looking at what is employment income. And uh, from, from the law, Section 18, sorry, Section 19 of the Income Tax Act is what gives us the scope of employment income or the mandate to tax employment income. And uh, it defines employment income to look at uh, uh, a position of an individual in employment of another, employment income to look at a position entitling a holder to a fixed or ascertainable remuneration, employment income as directorship of a company. So you will find that directors of a company are actually treated as employees of a company. And then uh, employment income as uh, acting in a position of the other. All that constitutes employment income. But what is unique about employment income is that we look at the master-servant relationship and uh, they should be an employer who can either be an individual or employee, and then an employee who is actually an individual. So uh, I had already talked about this, holding or acting in a public office is also employment income. If you are acting on behalf of someone, 
you are in an employment relationship. So uh, who is then an employer? An employer could either be an individual or a corporate who remunerates an individual. Remunerates or employs an individual. Uh, an employee is an individual, I already indicated that. A taxation of law employees and directors, what are the key considerations? We look at uh, one, the primary or secondary employer or director. Do you have only one director, one employer, or more than one? We will look at that later when we discuss under risks. You can have your primary employer, and then you have somewhere else where you work part time. So the primary employer will have to do the withholding obligations, and also the other one will also do. Like I'd indicated under section 119, employment tax is withheld at source through a system called pay as you earn. As you earn, they will keep deducting. So that is exactly what happens. And then we will also look at types of benefits of employment. And under here, you will appreciate that employment tax or okay, employment income will be structured in two ways. There is the cash benefits of employment and then the benefits in kind. The benefits in kind will be looked at earlier. And then any net incomes, there are some incomes that you could be receiving net. This will mainly apply to expatriates. Usually expatriates are very smart. If you are telling me that I'm, you, are, you are being taken to say South Africa, I will tell the employer that, you know, I don't know the tax regime of South Africa, but if I can only get my net of say $10,000 per month, you will take care of the taxes ETC. This is exactly what we say. Net-based contracts also have their own implications as we shall see later. Then we have uh, eligibility for tax deductions, which we will also look at. There is also what we call eligible, eligible for tax reliefs, or sometimes here in Uganda, tax exemptions. We do not have tax reliefs per se, but tax exemptions. And then specifically, we will also look at, are you a local employee or you are? Are you local or you are expatriate? So um, what, what is key then for us to understand is that for you to pay employment tax, you must actually be in an employment relationship. And what is an employment relationship? The employment relationship can best be distinguished if we are able to understand the difference between an independent consultant, that is a contract for services, or an employee contract for services. Am I in an employment relationship or I'm just in a contract for service relationship, a consultant for that matter? You will note that if I'm an employee, the responsibility for taxation is with the employer. He has to withhold this tax, file the returns to the tax authority. But if I'm an independent consultant, the responsibility is still with the employer but the method of withholding is a withholding tax. It can be 6% if I'm a resident or 15% if I'm non-resident. What is very key is that for me to be able to pay withholding, sorry, pay as you earn, I must be able to ascertain that the relationship between this individual and the employer is actually an employee-employer relationship. There are a number of indications that drive towards this. An individual who is an independent consultant should have more independence. More independence in the nature in which they control their work. More independence in the nature in which they integrate with the bigger part of the organization. More independence in the nature in which they take up risks for their work. Some questions to be considered are as indicated. Uh, feel free to let me know if you are following up. We are just looking at a number of indications that really will bring that independent employer-employee relationship. Is the relationship there real? Profit or economic reality? 
if if i work for my employer the employer takes all the risks i will come execute my work and then i'm paid at the end of the month in terms of independence if i'm an employee i depend so much on my employer to provide equipment work tools materials facilities used to execute this work that is exactly what we are saying but if i'm a contractor or a consultant i will be able to come with my laptop i will work from my office and maybe get information remotely or sometimes come on site but even when i come on site i will not be i will not be controlled by the timing of this uh, employer or, or i will manage my own time and maybe the deliverable is agreed on for purposes of timelines so um work for more than one firm if you are an employer most likely you will just engage with one person of course we've talked of instances where you can work for more than one or two employers that one is also there but uh, you will still have to define who the primary employer is services over to the general public that's if if you are working for whoever comes then you are really a consultant not an independent employer control control is something which is very very important in distinguishing between independent consultant and employee control in terms of timing control in terms of uh, the way work is done and in timing you will note that most employees work 40 hours a week and uh, if there is overtime that is also agreed and uh, control in terms of uh, reporting you have to prepare reports every friday for the week you have to prepare them in a particular format you have to attend meetings you have to attend trainings etc etc so these are really guidelines on employee independent employee consultation as you will note later on ladies and gentlemen this subject of independent of employer versus consultants is really an issue that is being discussed at uh, at very many for us for example there was a, a ruling recently by the insurance association uh, i think the insurance companies wanted to really understand their relationship with the agents who assist them to look for business whether they are really individual employees or consultants but as you will note this is really a summary of what will distinguish between a consultancy relationship and an employment relationship control and integration of part of the business i already talked about this scheduling of work and timing for an, an employee they will tell you to report at eight and then you have to complete work at five they could be even overtime you have to work method of remuneration you will not that uh, for an independent sorry for, for an employee an employee is actually entitled to a regular pay which comes in every month and most salaries are paid in arrears you first provide the service then you are paid at the end of the month so that is really characteristic of uh, an employee an unemployee also is entitled to some benefits under employment which we may come like for example leave pay maternity leave holidays medical benefits which are not there in a consultancy relationship nature of contract we said if you are a consultant that is a contract for services if you are an employee a contract of service the distinction in that is that if you employ me as sarah you are actually employing me to provide services as sarah but if if you are contracting me as a consultant i can consult i can contract but send someone else. For example, if you are consulting with a firm, a CPA firm, they will pick on the particular people to come. Maybe one comes tomorrow, another one comes the other day. So that, that is really the distinction. Contract of service, contract for services. Economic reality in terms of who bears the risk is also very, very important. Work tools in an employment relationship, they will provide you with a work table, there will be a desk there will be a laptop sometimes they can even give you a car to facilitate your work these are really unique things so uh, 
it is not really casting stone, but one or two of three of these will really define an employment relationship. Once we are satisfied that there is an employment relationship, then we will be interested in looking at the scope of employment income. What then constitutes employment income? But generally what we could say is that amount, any amount of benefit derived in respect of employment is provided in respect of one, past services of employment, you could be paid now for past services. Like for example, if they are recognizing you and giving you a bonus for performing very well in the past year, this is a payment in respect of past services of employment. You could also be paid for current services of employment, like your salary that comes every month, that is current services of employment. Or you are paid for prospective services of employment, you are being paid now, to provide services, say, in December, that is also another form of employment income. Employment income also stretches to a payment to a third party for the benefit of the employee. The best would be a salary being paid to a driver to drive you, the employee, wherever you, you, you will be, including your private errands. Or they pay for your domestic servants, like a house help, a gardener, to, to support you at home, that is a benefit paid to a third party under an arrangement with the employer for the benefit of the employee is also part of the scope of employment income. Employment income could either be in cash or non-cash. Non-cash, what we normally refer to as a benefit in kind. If it is cash, the list is really long. You will talk of uh, cash benefit of employment. It could be salary, leave allowance, transport allowance, gratuity, um, entertainment allowance. As long as it is paid in cash, that will constitute cash benefit of employment. And then uh, provided to the employer or associate of the employer for the benefit of the employee. This could be still benefiting kind because you may not be receiving the cash directly. For example, if they pay school fees for your children, all you bring is a bank, bank slip and the employer will go and pay the cash. Or the school even invoices the employer and the employer pays it directly. That is also employment income. Some employers are very good. They will pay a salary to your spouse, especially for expatriates. You are coming with your spouse and then uh, that spouse is also paid. That is also employment income or a benefit of employment to the person who is engaged with the employer. Air tickets for family members, all these are benefits of employment. And then number three, provided by employer or third party. This could be like uh, non-cash benefits. For example, medical insurance, is provided by a medical insurance company and you are able to get treatment in one of these hospitals. Utility bills, you will pay this cash to either Umeme or National Water and uh, the employee benefits. Gym or club benefit, you will pay that to the club and that is really a benefit in kind. So um, the other benefits in kind that are also unique and will have a computation formula is one, a motor vehicle benefit. The employer can give you a car to facilitate your work in office. When you are going for the employer's work issues, you will use this and this will be a part of employment income. However, there is a formula that is computed. We get the value of the motor vehicle and then you, you multiply by the number of days that this car is used for private use and then divide by 365 days in a year. For purposes of the act, a year of income is 365 days. 20% of that value is what will be the motor vehicle benefit. This is an annual formula. So if you are computing the benefit for the month, then you will prorate it on a monthly basis. Uh, effective July 2017, 
the cost of the vehicle is reduced at a rate of 35% on reducing balance depreciation. And uh, you will note that if you are using this car for maybe two or three years, each year that value should come down. And this is really fair because you could not, you may not enjoy the same comfort as you were enjoying when the car was still new. The older the car, the lesser the benefit and therefore the lesser the tax. So with time, you end up using this car and you don't even have to pay tax. House benefit or what we refer to as accommodation benefit in kind is the other one. Uh, they will get for you a house and uh, the employer pays for it. The, the employer could also choose to give you a cash benefit and then you go and look for your own house. That will not fall under benefits in kind. It will be a cash benefit of employment. But if the employer gets a house for you, pays the landlord directly, all you do is to enjoy the facility. This is a benefit in kind. The way this is computed is that we will compare 15% of the total emoluments, including market rent, and then compare it with the market rent. Market rent is what you actually pay to the landlord for the rent on a monthly basis. Or if it is the employer house, like how many of these employers may have their own houses for their key staff, then we will be able to get the value market rent by looking at similar size of houses within that vicinity, how much would they go for? Then we shall use that approximate figure to determine the market rent and therefore determine the accommodation benefit in kind. So that is how the accommodation benefit in kind. It can be given either in cash or in kind. So if it is in kind, we shall quantify the benefit or monetize the benefit. The other is what we refer to as loan or interest benefit in kind, where the employer can give you a loan on very good terms low interest rates, and uh, usually how would you determine a, a low interest rate? If the interest rate is below the BOU or statutory rate, then that interest will be taxed. The difference between the BOU rate and the company rate is what is taxed. So we compare the BOU rate and the company rate, and that is what we tax. So in, in it's important for tax planning that if you are going to give your employees loans, you could just give it at the BOU rate, which is usually the tax-free rate, to avoid getting any tax. But you could as well enjoy a discounted rate and then you pay tax to the taxman. Uh, loan or interest benefit is also triggered where there is what we call salary advance. And salary advances these advances are more than are recovered for more than three months and the amount is more than a million. So again, for tax planning purposes, if you don't want to pay tax on this, make sure that any advances are recovered within a three month period and that they are also less than a, a million. If they go beyond that, we shall be able to tax it and the rate of tax will be the BOU rate because most of these salary advances do not have interest. <clears throat> Other benefits in kind would be value of a benefit in kind to an employee by virtue of their employment or the cost to the employer is the benefit in kind. So we just wanted to see how would you really be able to value other benefits in kind. The key test is how much did it did the employer incur to purchase this thing? What is the cost of the employer providing this service to you? Whatever the employer pays will be the benefit of employment that we quantify. So that is exactly. So actual for cost to the employer is what is considered. How much school fees did the employer pay? How much salary does the employer pay the driver? How much does the employer pay the domestic servants? How much did the employer pay for this holiday trip? That is the benefit in kind. So this is a summary of the taxability of benefits. And you will see from this table that medical insurance is an exempt benefit. Uh, NSSF, usually for NSSF, the company will contribute 
for those of you who are in the private sector, this benefit is not taxable. I liked yesterday when Parliament was pushing that the benefits should not attract the 30 percent tax. I think it is okay because we are already choking with a lot of tax. Individuals pay tax up to 40 percent, and yet companies pay up to 30 percent. So really, it is it is a welcome move. Gratuity is all. So taxable, there was a court case on this. Uh, URA, there was an appeal and this ruling was and the appeal that gratuity is indeed taxable. Um, personal accident, not taxable. Resettlement allowance, taxable. Housing benefit, we've said it's taxable. Reimbursement of medical expense is exempt. We will discuss that again. Airtime for use for business, not taxable. Children's school fees, where they are paying for your school fees, taxable. Hardship allowance. You know, even if you want to baptize it in any way, the taxman is really very, very sober. To the extent that this payment is incidental to your services of employment, there will be a tax trigger. I, I like the way government calls it had to reach allowance for some of the teachers who are teaching in, in schools where even a vehicle doesn't reach. And like in, a, I come from the mountainous area of Capturra, there are cliffs down there where you need to use a ladder to access. So you, you find those, those schools down there will be now what we call hard to reach. So if you got that allowance, it is still taxable. Freight for personal, effects if you are coming from outside uganda to work here and they are going to ship your personal effects that benefit is tax is not taxable the air ticket also for the employee is not taxable but if you choose to come with your family the spouse and children tickets for the children and the spouse will be paid for by the employer but will be taxable Meals to all staff on equal basis, not taxable. You run through this list in the interest of time, but uh, it, it makes it very, very easy for you to really conceptualize some of these things. Staff quarters benefit, not taxable, especially for those uh, low cadre staff. Um, exempt employment income. Now, generally, if you earn less than 235 per month, which is 2,820,000 per annum, it is exempt employment income. So um, if you just want to maintain earning 235, then you won't really be paying any tax. But if you work hard and pay more, then we will share more with that government as well in form of tax. Pension is also an exempt employment benefit discharge or reimbursement of medical expenses and actual sorry discharge or reimbursement of medical expenses actually incurred if i went to case hospital got treated i paid one million then i bring that receipt and claim the one million from my employer that reimbursement of that medical expense by my employer because it is on actual basis will be an exempt employment. If uh, related on medical, medical can come in three ways. It could come either as a cash benefit of employment. If it is cash, it is taxable. If it is a non-cash, it is exempt. But the way it is non-cash, it will be maybe through a medical insurance. The employer engages a medical insurance fund to, to provide the service. That is also an exempt uh, benefit. Or it could be a reimbursement like we have said, it is also exempt. There is also instance where you will go get the treatment and then the hospital will bill your employer. That will also be exempt. Uh, Chair, I hope we are moving on well. <clears throat> yes, I think so far we are moving on well. I saw a comment from one of the participants, though, that you are 
uh, a bit fast, but I don't know whether this comment is representative of a larger part of the of the team, or I'm not very sure. But that's but I think so far let, is, let, is, is is going on well. Let me let me reduce a bit. Um, generally, speaker but it's okay. I appreciate. Let me reduce a bit. Benefits of employment. Okay. Employment benefits that do not attract tax. You will get the benefit, but you won't have to pay tax. Life insurance premium. The way life insurance premium is, is provided is that you will, the employer will, will, use, will, will pay insurance premiums for their employees. In the event of the unfortunate death of the employer, then the, 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 the dependents will benefit from this. This could be in form of school fees for the children, etc. So that is what we refer to as a life insurance premium. It is only exempt if the employer is a taxable person. Taxable person would be maybe a company like MTN that pays income tax, but if the employer is a government which is exempt, then you will be able to pay that tax. That is the distinction. I hope it's clear. Uh, other, other insurances like workman compensation will also be exempt benefit of employment. Expenses incurred by the employee or discharge or reimbursement of the employee on official duty of the employer. For example, we are accountants. You may have gone to the field to do some audit work and they will pay for all your expenses, per diem, safari day allowance, accommodation allowance, transport allowance. We are saying this is exempt to the extent that you incur them in the official course of executing the services of the employer. And then uh, meals and refreshments, all value thereof provided to all employees on equal terms. If you are able to provide to all employees on equal terms, the act talks of within the premises of the employer. But uh, I, uh, I, 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 I would think that the key test here is, is it equal basis on equal basis to all staff on equal basis? How would you demonstrate equal basis? Where, for example, the meals are provided in form of a buffet, and then you will be able to line up whether you are a, a, a tea girl or a messenger or the MD, they will be entitled to the same food, then you will be able to have an exemption from this benefit. I see some organizations, especially manufacturing entities, where the food is, is cooked in different phases. For the casual workers who work in the factory, those ones will have portion beans and rice. And then for the middle staff, some meat, rice, and maybe some groundnuts and some beans. And then uh, for the senior staff, some chicken, etc. And then you may even have some staff, maybe staff who, who eat halal, or it could even be discriminated based on race. Maybe uh, Indian, Indian food here, or Chinese, or Japanese. That level of segregation may not give you this because the law says to all staff on equal basis. So we want to look at the value of this meal. If it is all tender and everyone is benefiting, we give you that exemption for the meal. Employer's contribution, 10%. If you work with a private entity, you are supposed to contribute to NSSF for your monthly pension. And this contribution to NSSF comes in a way that the employer has to contribute 10%. 10% cash emoluments. I hope the word cash is highlighted. Cash emoluments. And then you, the employee, you contribute 15 of gross cash emoluments. So the other benefits in kind, which we were talking about of the vehicle ETC, will not fall within the scope of NSSF. So that benefit of 10% is an exempt benefit of employer employment. I think what what the new act of NSSF wanted to attempt to do was to make this exempt now and then tax it when you are receiving. But I think it 
is better to pay the tax now and then tomorrow you just enjoy the service when you would have. Another one is provision of security services. <clears throat> the key test here is, is the security service provided in kind or in cash? If the security service is an allowance, a cash allowance, we will tax it. But if it is in, in kind, I just find the guard reporting to my premises every evening. And then uh, the, the security company will, 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 what? will invoice my employer at the end of every month. That benefit is exempt. But if it is cash, then it is taxable. Just like for, uh, uh, sorry, for medical insurance, medical benefits, we said if it is a cash allowance, it is, it is taxable. If it is non-cash, it is exempt. So um, expenses incurred by the employee on official duty. Yeah, this one we have already gone through. Non-cash benefits whose value is less than 10,000. We, we have been pushing through ICPAU to amend this provision because it is really overtaken by events. If someone bought you a meal of 10,000, you can really, I don't know, maybe Katogo would be so good for 10,000. Or if someone bought you a flower of 10,000, it could just be one rose flower. So uh, the law is saying that is exempt. Anything above that should be taxable. But again, you are looking at non-cash benefit less than 10,000 per month. That, that figure is too low, and we, we were proposing to push it at least to maybe 100,000. Relief of 25% of terminal benefits for employees who have served the same employer for at least 10 years. You are leaving this employer, you've worked with it for 10 years, you are getting your terminal benefits. What the law is saying is that we will only tax 75% of this income, 25 will be exempt. So if you are about to leave your employment and you're almost clocking 10 years, you could consider this as one of the planning tools. And you are like, let me first get my exemption, then I leave after. So that is good. I don't know what was the motive of this for you to stay with the same employer for 10 years, or I don't know. Passage costs, we, we, we talked about it and we said that passage costs could be in three ways. One, the air ticket of the employee, that one is exempt. If passage costs also constitute air tickets for the dependents, that one is taxable. If the passage costs constitute shipment costs for the belongings, it is also exempt. Like for example, if you are coming from Tanzania or Zambia, I think, yeah. you want to come with all your things, including even your worker, that shipping cost will be exempt. Employment income of an expatriate employee in a listed institution or under a technical assistance agreement subject to the minister's approval. So they are listed institutions where really employees don't pay taxes. Uh, those ones like people in the UN, or if you are under a technical assistance agreement, the, the ministry sometimes bring in people and it is through that technical assistance agreement. So the employees come and work, but they are exempted from employment income. And then uh, we are also looking at official employment income of persons employed in the armed forces, in Uganda police force and Uganda prisons. This excludes persons serving in their civilian capacity. So if you are working in, in accounts, you may not benefit from this, but they are looking at the security people working in those institutions. Employment income of Ugandans posted to work in Uganda diplomatic missions abroad. Employment income of persons employed by East African Development Bank. These people are lucky. They are net pay is equal to their gross pay. Uh, taxation of expatriates, key considerations. Expatriates are employees who are mainly non-citizens 
coming here to work in Uganda. Now, like I was telling you, when these people come, their organizations are really very keen, especially on their taxation bits. They may want to give them net-based contracts so that this mobility is not disadvantaged by the tax regime in that host country. I may be coming from maybe country A, where the tax rate is 30% or 25%. I'm going to country B, where the tax rate is 40%. So in most cases, these employers will not want this mobility to be affected by the differences in the taxation regimes in the different countries. So they will take care of all this in their contracts. But what is very key is for us to understand whether these people are taxable here in Uganda or not. And what I wanted to say is that residence becomes a very key uh, test in determining the taxability of these expatriates. The number of days that these people will be in Uganda is very, very important. And for residents, we have the 183 day rule, which is approximately six months. How long have you been in Uganda? If you are going to be in Uganda for six or more months, then we shall tax you based on resident rates. If you are in Uganda for less than 183 days, which is less than six months, we will tax you using non-resident rates. These rates are in, in the act and uh, you will note that if you are a non-resident, you do not even benefit from the threshold. They, there is that tax-free income which comes with residents. Remember with the 235, which we say is tax exempt. So what is, uh, what is key in taxation of expatriates? One, are they exercising their services of employment here or not? Number two, uh, if they are exercising from here, what, what type of work are they doing? I would bring out a, a unique scenario where uh, you have a client B Client B is a, an employer of the Ugandan resident company with its headquarters, say, in German. And um, there is a subsidiary in Uganda. So this person has, is a German citizen who had come to Uganda and did work for, say, three years. He was supposed to live in March, but because of COVID, this person could not leave. So uh, he had already finished his three-year period in Uganda. So he remained in Uganda, but doing work for German. Are you seeing? Where are the services of employment being exercised? Uganda. But the work, is be, the work being done is for German. So you may find that the complexities around taxation of expatriates would require that this guy continues paying taxes here in Uganda unless there are some provisions within a double tax treaty between Uganda and German, if it is there, which is not there actually, would exempt the person. So those are some of the considerations. And then credits available or proof of tax paid if, if the foreign country is able to relieve you on the foreign tax. In Uganda here, we have what we call foreign tax credit. Foreign employment income, is exempted from further tax if the tax has been paid in the foreign country or the employment tax has been paid in that foreign tax. So uh, types of emoluments, trailing income, it is very, very important. You could also find instances where this person wants the money to be paid in his own country and whatever he gets here in Uganda are just allowances that will facilitate his or her stay here. But the bank account, the money is paid back home. So uh, again, what I want to say is that regardless of where the money is paid, what is very important is that where are we sourcing this income and Uganda will have to tax this money because the services are being uh, exercised here. Services of employment are being rendered here and therefore, Uganda has the primary right 
to tax this income. Again, still on taxation and expatriates, key considerations. Are they short term assignees liable to tax in Uganda? As the, the period is very, very important. The law talks of a short term land resident, a short term resident uh, is someone who is here for less than two years. But even if the person is here for less than 183 days, we would only maybe tax him based on income that he sourced here, not his worldwide income. Remember, residence gives us the extent to which we tax this individual. If the individual is resident, we will tax based on worldwide income. But if he is non resident, we will only tax income sourced in Uganda for the period he was here as non resident. So when do you start taxing from the time they start earning income here in Uganda? Unless they are exempted from a double tax agreement or a technical assistance agreement between Uganda and that foreign country. Residence for expatriates, I think I've already talked about this. The test of 183 days is very, very important. And also the fact that you can also test over a three year period. If this expatriate was in Uganda for an average of 122 days, he becomes tax resident. Uh, residence issues and expatriate taxation, we've talked about this. I've talked of a short term resident where only the foreign sourced income is exempt. We will only tax the income sourced in Uganda. And we say the short term resident is one who has been here for less than two years. Those are really areas that you can be able to, to do a lot of uh, planning when coming. Interaction with the DTS, right to tax. Some DTS give uh, exemption of some income. Some DTS give exemptions to some income. Uh, Uganda has DTS with a few countries, and uh, so it's important to look at a DTA if someone is coming from a DTA country with Uganda. Examples of DTA countries would be Mauritius, South Africa. We even have uh, Zambia. In Uganda, it's Zambia and South Africa. Then we have uh, other DTA countries like, uh, like India, UK, Netherlands, ETC. Um, other than a double tax treaty, an expatriate's employment income is sourced in Uganda, may be exempt from tax under official employment income derived by a person in public service of the government of a foreign country, subject to conditions under Section 21. Section 21 provides for the Ex different sources of exempt income there. So if you are working with uh, uh, Uganda's foreign mission, say maybe the embassy of Uganda in Nairobi, your income will be exempt from tax. An allowance payable outside Uganda to a person working in Uganda's foreign mission is also exempt from tax. And what I also wanted to say, actually one talks of foreign employment income that you are going to earn in that foreign country is subject to a final tax if the income tax has been paid in that foreign country. So if you are going to earn employment income, say in Rwanda, if Rwanda is able to confirm that the tax was paid, that becomes a final tax and Uganda will not have to pay that tax. So it is a universal credit for foreign employment income. Residence issues again under expatriate taxation, tax treatment of uh, benefits. These are really just key taxation issues for residents, for expatriates. Expatriates normally will come with their benefits and uh, this will be treated separately. But what is key is that if this expatriate is coming with a net based contract, it is also important that uh, these contracts are analyzed for tax. If you are coming with a net based contract, it means that the, the employer is taking care of the tax bit. And that tax which is being paid for by the employer is also a benefit in kind. 
So these contracts have to be grossed up and the correct tax is paid. Uh, we also have what we call tax equalization, where they equalize. Equalizing means I will be able to earn my same net pay regardless of the differences in the tax rates because my employer is able to equalize, to tax equalize. So normally what happens is that we will do what we call a shadow payroll in that other foreign country and that shadow payroll is able to tell you how much additional tax as a company that you are paying in respect of this expatriate. So uh, those are what we call it individual tax, uh, individual tax, individual tax uh, planning. Normally, many of these multinationals will, will want you to advise their expatriates on their tax taxes when they come in. We normally refer to them as expatriate tax briefings. We brief them when they are coming in Uganda and also brief them when they are going. Just about the tax regime here, what, 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 what are the statutory deductions like? What is the tax regime like? What is taxable? What is exempt? ETC, ETC. So there are also issues of social security payments. Uh, for example, if they were already subscribing to another uh, social security scheme or a retirement benefit scheme back home, they may want to continue with the other one and not continue with this one of Uganda, the NSSF. So we tell them what are the key considerations and how can you save for that. We note that uh, there are also issues of if someone is non-resident, he can be exempted from paying this NSSF here. Uh, some conditions again will apply. Other benefits in kinds like share options are also very common with expatriates. These expatriates give, are given shares to, to be part of the owners of the uh, employer. And uh, when you own these shares, you can dispose them at one time. So even on, on being granted the shares, there is a benefit in kind that has to be quantified. If, for example, the employer gave you 100 shares, 100 shares at 200 or at 500 per share, that benefit will be a benefit in kind. But it is also possible that uh, you can be given these shares and then after three years, you choose to dispose them. If you are able to dispose them for a profit, then there is a, a, a capital gains tax on the difference. So that is also an important note. Uh, <coughs> the other one is uh, now to look at other employee employment income tax risks, variance between pay returns and the uh, staff costs in the financial statements. I'm just looking at if you're an employer, what are the key risk areas for employment income? Usually what happens is that when you file returns, they will be in the URA system. What URA does mainly is to just review those returns and then trace them back to the financial statements. If they are not able to match, then that becomes a risk area. Non-remittance of pay, which results into late payments, interest, and penalties. That is also a key risk. Pay is supposed to be remitted every 15th day of the following month. It's important that you keep track of that and be able to pay in time. Then uh, under declaration of pay, those variances, this month you pay less by 200, the other month you pay less, those are all tax triggers which create risks. Non-taxation of allowances. I like the way people put it and say, you know, we, we just facilitate only transport for them to be able to come and work and maybe some lunch. They don't really earn anything. But according to, to the law, to the, to, the VA, to, sorry, to the income tax law, they, they, they refer this transport from home to work as 
a private or domestic benefit, which is actually taxable. That this transport doesn't, it cannot be, it is a benefit because when you come from home up to work, you are just in a position now to offer your services of employment. It's not that you have really helped the employer in any way. So because of that, that becomes a taxable benefit. So allowances really must be looked at in a very, very important way. Sometimes you may even have part-time staff and you just choose to give them some allowances. But remember, we said incomes less than 235 per month is what is exempt. Anything above that will be taxable. You could even choose to give non-cash benefits. But if those non-cash benefits are quantified and are more than the 235, you may have to pay tax on that. Uh, taxation of uh, employees with more than one employer. How would you test that? If, if you are a primary employer, you will definitely have to file returns and give them the threshold. But if you are a secondary employer, then you will only treat them as, as what part-time staff and tax them at 30%. There is also a risk of you confirming whether these people are actually in the 30% bracket or 40. Remember the 40% bracket is when you earn more than 10 million per month. So uh, it, is, it is really important. If you are a secondary employer, just be sure to confirm the, 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 what? the threshold for this individual. Are they in 30% or 40%? I find this a lot with people who work as directors, board of directors in different organizations. If you work as a board of director in different organizations, you may earn board allowances here Company B gives you a retainer, a monthly retainer, and also an allowance. Company C gives you another retainer and monthly allowance. There now you may have to file a return of income and declare all that income and ensure that you are paying tax in the right income threshold. Ability to distinguish between part-time employees and consultants is very, very important. There is a, I want to give you a, an example here. We have a, I had a client we interviewed with where the, the HR manager had resigned. He used to be a property, but this manager resigned and then the, 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 this company decided to engage the manager on a consultancy arrangement or part-time arrangement. So the way the part-time arrangement worked was that this manager would come three times in a week. And in those three times, he would not even have to work full day. She would do like four hours a day. And uh, she was part of the emailing of the organization. She would participate in meetings and then they would pay her a monthly salary. And then she continued working like that for two years. Now, when the tax authority came, they, they said, this person is not a consultant. This person is actually an employee. So uh, what is important is substance over form. If you look at the way this person was working, it was very similar to an employment relationship because you, you just continued, you, you reduced on the way, the way you are working, less hours and even less, the fewer days, but you kept coming to do the same work. You are part of the, emailing system of the organization. There is, there is your office there, a desk and a chair. And then, uh, so you find that the employer still controls the way you work. It is difficult to work for another person on a full-time basis because this employer has taken three days of your week. So we, to we, we, we told the client that this, this is really an employment relationship and therefore, you have to decide to just put this person on the payroll. So that is what we were saying. Ability to distinguish between part-time and consultant relationship can be a tax risk for employment income. The URA comes, you've been withholding 6% for three years. 
URA comes to Dan and say, no, 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 this person is an employee, you should have taxed this person at 40%. And if you did not withhold, and later on the withholding obligation comes, the, 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 this burden will fall on the withholding agent, who in this case will be the employee. So uh, tax treatment for non-resident stroke employees. The distinction between short-term resident tax on Uganda sourced income only. Those are the key things that we consider. Uh, I just want to know again if we are still together. Yes, we are. Uh, Sarah, we are. So, I believe so the members are following. Continue again with the employment income tax risks. Tax treatment of interest on benefits, salary advances versus company loans. So you, you can just say, no, no, this is just an advance, not a loan. But uh, when you actually give a loan, then you say this is a loan. But again, like I indicated, if it is a salary advance, conditions apply. Otherwise, a loan will be triggered. And if you don't want a loan to be triggered, make sure you maintain the they, they, they what they recover within the three month window. Computation of pay on lump sum benefits, gratuity versus bonus payments. Actually, lump sum benefits becomes a very key area to focus on because you are supposed to annualize. Annualization means the ability of you putting this employee in the right income ban. If, for example, I've been earning 10 million. Sorry, 8 million, 8 million, 8 million. I was not over the 10 million mark, so I was paying tax at 30%. And then now I'm going to be earning uh, a, a, what? On the 12th month, I earn bonus of, say, 80 million. This bonus is likely, if I add all the 8 million for the 12th month, including the 80 million, this bonus takes me to the bracket of more than 10 million. And because of that, I may have to pay tax at 40% on the 12th month. So ability to test that will be able to put this individual in the right income ban. And therefore this person will pay the correct tax. Uh, initially those days, those earlier days, you would need to go to URA to assist you to compute these benefits. But now with the e-tax, there is a sheet for lump sum payments that you have to compute to put those lump sum payments directly so that you are able to pay tax at the right rate. This is very important because you can either end up over taxing someone or you end up under taxing. When you under tax, you, you will have a risk of paying more tax. When you overtax, it is unfair to the employee. So that is very, very important. Treatment of local service tax. Remember, local service tax is tax deductible. You are supposed to remove it before computing pay as you earn. So there is a tax saving there. It is important that you are doing that so that you don't really make your employees pay an additional coin. Tax is already not a very nice thing to pay. Ability to structure benefits from a tax planning perspective. Okay, structuring is one thing, but I was saying it could also end up being a risk if you over plan. You want to call something a reimbursement when it is actually an allowance. And that may not really help you much. You, you are trying to conceal, but at the end of the day, the truth will come out. Net of tax contracts for expatriates, the tax which is not considered there becomes a benefit in kind because ordinarily tax is paid by the individual and not the company. When you give net-based contracts, it's like you are taking care of the tax costs for the individual. So that becomes also a benefit in kind. Uh, passage costs, dependent benefits are taxable. Remember, this is what we say. The others are exempt but make sure that you tax the dependent benefits. Life insurance premium, taxable versus non-taxable. The key test here is, is the employer a taxable person? If the employer is a taxable person, this insurance premium becomes an exempt benefit. 
resident status of the employee determines the scope of taxation. If someone is resident, we will tax based on worldwide income. If the person is non-resident, then we tax only income sourced in Uganda. I hope that is clear. Residence determines the scope of taxation. If you are non-resident, we only tax income sourced in Uganda. If you are resident, we only tax the worldwide income. Short-term resident for expatriates, only the foreign sourced income is taxed. Uh, the other one is review of the double tax treaty provisions on salaries, wages, and place of exercise of services of employment in consideration of residents and non-residents status for employees. So th this is also important. You may end up taxing some people when they shouldn't be taxed. If you look at uh, the DTA, especially the one for Netherlands and Uganda, you will find that there are some conditions that will make some employees here not pay tax based on the DTA provision. So you want to look at really their taxation from a very wide scope. So uh, from this discussion of employment income, you will note that uh, tax is very wide and it really depends on are you a local person or you are foreign. If you are foreign, your tax issues are quite unique from a local person. If you are also local, the tax issues are unique. We also have NSSF risks which come along and uh, we say that you want to look at your resident status or are you as an employee exempted from this NSSF or an employee is not employed in Uganda and therefore is not supposed to be paid tax, who is eligible for this NSSF tax they say from the age of 16, uh, above 16 and below 55, but you can still continue paying even when you are above 55. That's a practice question, which is very, very simple. Gloria has just been offered two accounting jobs at the same time. XYC Uganda Limited offering to pay her 5 million and Bank of Uganda offering to pay her 5 million. Both jobs give the same salary of 5 million. So both jobs have also the same additional benefits. Life insurance premium of 12 months per, per million, per year, sorry. BOU will give 12 months per year. XYC will also give 12 months per year. Medical cover for self and dependence, equivalent to 20 million. What are the tax implications? Assuming Gloria, had also offered, okay, let's first look at this. What are the tax implications? What I note is that BOU is not, a, meaning that the life insurance of 12 million will be taxable. But XYZ, XYZ is a taxable employer, so the life insurance of 12 million will be exempt benefit. So you could choose to want to go to XYZ based on a tax planning approach. And then part, the second bit says, assuming Gloria had also been offered a job with Uganda prisons, advise her on which job has the most tax savings. Remember, if Gloria is going to work in Uganda prisons, she will be in her civilian capacity because she's an accountant. So the tax the tax implications may be may not be different from BOU. But if she went to Uganda prisons as a security person, then the entire five million will be exempt from tax. Remember, in the in the in our discussion, we said exempt employment income, it is only exempt if you are working in a capacity of a, 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 a security person and not civilian. There are other practice questions. I want to leave time for questions. Uh, Jordan joined XYZ group in 2013. He applied for a, a loan of 100 million to construct his residential house in Tinder in January 2015. The bank offered him a loan at an interest rate of 9% payable over six years. The statutory rate is 15% and the commercial rate is 24. 
we normally compare with the BOU or statutory rate. We do not compare with the commercial or market rate. So to get the tax benefit at the interest Sorry, we seem to be having some internet interruption. Uh, Sarah, we are not getting you. Hello? Are you able to hear me now? Yes, yes, it's back. It's back, eh? Yeah. I hope you didn't lose me for a long period. It was about three minutes, I think. Okay. Two minutes. The beauty is that we shall share the slides so you will be able to follow. So we were just discussing about this loan benefit by Jordan who joined XYZ group. And we said that to determine the interest benefit, only compare the BOU rate with the, with the, the company rate. So the statutory rate is 15%, compare it to the company rate of 9%. The difference of 8%, you multiply it with the loan and then times 12 of over 12, that will be the annual benefit. So this interest benefit can be spread over the 12 month period so that the employee is able to pay tax based on that. So that is the interest benefit in kind. We were now talking about the tax planning ideas and we said that the key tax planning tool should be by the employers because the employers take all the heat if pay is not deducted in time. So it is impo important that you pay the tax in time by the 15 and also file the returns on time. These days with the e-tax, if, if you file the return on time, it will recognize an assessment. You pay the tax later, it computes interest on a daily basis. So you really don't want to mess yourself up and then you find yourself waking up to a very huge interest in the system. And uh, you know, URA does not regularly share their tax ledgers, so you may only come to learn about a payment which you didn't make after maybe two years when the interest is quite a lot. Continuously engage a tax consultant to review your payroll contracts and returns to ensure compliance. A tax review or a tax health check is usually advised. And it, it is really good that you are doing the right thing. Tax is very, uh, tax is very fragile. It, it changes every year. So because of that, it's good for you to be up to speed with the changes in the tax law so that you are also being able to, you are able, you are sure that you are doing the correct thing. Employees should also always check on their NSSF remittances to avoid surprises. Sometimes you can just be thinking the employer is paying when they are not paying and yet you are being deducted that money. It's important that you check. Consider structuring some benefits for tax savings. Remember, I told you for medical allowance, if it is a cash, you will tax, you will pay the tax, but when it, if it is in kind, you, it will be an exempt benefit. So those are really things that you can also consider. Most employers do not treat local service tax as a deductible expense, and yet this makes you pay slightly less tax than you would have paid if you just deducted it directly. Employees should file in video returns if they have other sources of income other than employment. 
If you have other sources of income other than employment, you are supposed to file a return. But if you only have employment income, then you don't have to file a return. So um, those are really some high, on a high level basis, those are some of the tax planning areas. I leave you with this quote, the ultimate test of your knowledge is your capacity to convey it to another. I hope you have learned some tax. You will be able to get the slides. Over to you, Clayton, for any queries. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah, for that very elaborate uh, presentation. Uh, I do hope that the members will all uh, uh, appreciate. Unfortunately, on this webinar, it's not easy for us to <laughs> physically clap our hands and appreciate, but I believe that everybody is quite, uh, quite impressed with the, with the very good uh, uh, presentation. So it is uh, 3.28 now. We have about 30 minutes to the close of this program for today. And I would suggest that we take about 20, uh, 25 minutes uh, addressing questions and answers. And then uh, we will give the remainder of the time to ICPAU to do some, uh, some briefs and, and, and yeah, a few housekeeping issues before we conclude. So I am going to be selecting uh, a number of questions and, and then uh, Sarah, you will attend to this. Uh, I'm going to do this randomly. Uh, just a minute, just hold on, just excuse me, please. Hello, so I was saying I'm going to select some of these questions randomly. Uh, please, if you have indicated your question and I don't select, it's not that I don't like you, just take it easy. It's, we have limited time and it's going to be uh, a random selection. Uh, Sarah, the first question that I'd like you to address, uh, someone by the name Yasin Sem. Senkubuge say, in a situation where a company hires an expatriate from the US, for example, a teacher who then teaches online to students in Uganda, how should such a person be treated for tax purposes as an employee or as a consultant? This is now online teaching somebody based in the US, but teaching students online in Uganda. How should such a person be taxed? Uh, the second question, that I will select is regarding to machine operators. Someone by the name James Okello says, how about machine operators who have just been engaged to operate a bulldozer, for example, for a single contract? Is that a contract for employment or not? That is the second question. And then the third question I will take is from one Jimmy. He says, thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. My question is as follows. A hospital stroke clinic has a contract with the senior pediatrician on a consultancy arrangement whose work only depends on a call to handle adverse or critical events and, and is paid on a monthly basis upon submitting an invoice. And 6% withholding tax is deducted. This arrangement has been closed for as has been for close to three years. Does this pose a tax risk in the event that the taxman challenges this claiming it should have been treated under employment income as part-time employee? Uh, I think Sarah, you will attend to these three questions first and then we will proceed with the next set. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Clayton. I hope you are able to hear me. Yes. Yes, we are. Yeah. Able to. So, uh, to your scene, if someone, if you are hiring an expatriate to work here, 
uh, you wanted to know whether this person really is an employee or an employer. Of course, it is like a part-time arrangement, uh, but like what we were saying, how is your mode of engagement with this expatriate? The, the other tests that we said are very, very important. This expatriate is able to, to teach on a regular basis. How do you engage him? Is he, does he come only on those particular periods and then the other periods he is not? Because even here, we, like I, I indicated to you, you, you can be part-timing over the weekend to teach somewhere in one of these professional courses. Uh, again, the, your engagement between you and that organization is, is really what will define whether there is an employee-employer relationship. Of course, the law recognizes part-time employees. And the reason why we call them part-time employees is that you are being controlled by this employee employer, I mean. You, you come to work at a particular time. You have to come to class at a particular time. If there is a class tomorrow between nine and midday, you will be there. And then there will be, you, they will even be able to grant you leave. So the mode of pay is also very important. And then control. We, we talked about control. And integration. Are you an integral part of the organization? If there are any planning things for the organization, do you attend those? Are you part of the integral part of their business? Is, is how is the timing like? So you can't really cast stone, but it is important to just look at the substance of the entire arrangement in, in an employee-employer relationship as opposed to a contractor relationship. Um, it, is, it can go either way, but sometimes, you know, the tax authority can get very aggressive. For example, you can have people just flying in to come and teach for three months. I mean, for a two weeks in a semester for three months. They teach in these two weeks and fly back. They will come back again after three months. Would those ones be in an employment relationship? Maybe no. But if you are going to teach online, continuously the other semester you are also there it can either be a withholding or they are included as part of the employment but you see now if you are to treat them as part-time employees they need to get things they need to there are some complexities really but uh, it's also important to word your contract in the correct way so that it is tax efficient then number two is uh, the machine operators. You will appreciate that in construction sites, we have part-time staff, these casuals who come. They will work for one month, others go, others come in, others go, others come in. The key test is that they are still real employees. You need to just track their payments. If they are more than the 235, then you have to declare tax. If they are less, then they will not pay tax. So it, a machine operator is really an employee relationship. How much, how, how long does he work is also an important thing. How long does he work? So if he works for one month, two months, three months, is he above the threshold, then he has to pay tax. So uh, this one of part-time employee, you can be a part-time employee and you also send an invoice. But you, you may be a part-time consultant and send the invoice. Again, it's in the substance of the relationship. How is your relationship structured in terms of control, in terms of being integration, work tools? Are you independent in your workings? Are, are you part of the supervision of this employer's business? Those are the things that we really test. How is your remuneration structured? Does it look like an employment relationship? It, it is really, it, 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 it's on a case by case basis. So if you are going to treat this as a, a withholding and therefore a contractor relationship, make sure that the, the contracts are tax efficient. Very, very important. They match what you are going to do in, in the relationship or in the transaction. Thank you, over to you, Clayton. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have a question from 
Sophia, Sophia Chomuhendu, who says, I have an employee earning Uganda shillings 12 million who resigns effective 31st July, has, has an entitlement of leave pay of Uganda shillings 10 million, but chooses to forego 6 million. Just, just they, say it again. Entitled. I have an, an employee yeah, yeah. And, yeah, entitled to gross pay of 12 million who resigns effective 31st July. He has an entitlement of leave pay of Uganda shillings 10 million, but chooses to forego 6 million. I don't know for what reason choosing to forego 6 million. Should I charge the 6 million before pay or after pay? And should this be charged at 40%? If he chooses to forego the 6 Yes. It means that they are now paying the employee four million. Is that the case? Yes, exactly. Now, this reason for foregoing, I'm not very sure, but I guess maybe it could be in terms of working days, the extra working days. If a person has designed and there, there's outstanding leave, I think the choosing to forego is to reduce the number of days work and forego, but it still remains a benefit, isn't it? Oh, or chooses to be paid a salary for the period of the six months, and this one is paid cash. Anyway, either way, you will have to pay the tax. You, so this other one, you will pay tax on the 16 million. This one will definitely be on the 40% bracket. And then uh, the other one, which is forgot, if you've not earned, then it's okay. What triggers a benefit is, for example, if, if you owed an employer, assuming the employer had given you a loan, and maybe uh, they, they now waive that loan. They say this is a very important resource. Let's waive the loan. That waived loan is also a benefit in kind, and it will be taxed. So uh, that, that, that is exactly. But now, if this is being waived, I don't know if the employee is waiving, then it means there is nothing to tax. Yes, Clayton, okay. you can. Oh, okay, let me take some more questions. Uh, the first one is from Sharon, Sharon Asingura. What if the employer gives benefits to employees for every three years? That is at the point of contract renewal. Does the 25% tax benefit apply? I repeat, if the employer gives benefits, that is terminal benefits to employees after every three years at the time of renewal of the contract. Does the 25% tax benefit apply? The 25% tax benefit won't apply because it normally applies at the point of exiting the employment relationship. If I'm leaving employer A, the test is how many years have I, have I worked here? If I've worked for more than 10 years, then I will benefit. But this other organizations which have contracts which are issued every three years and it's renewed even if if you are paid gratuity it's just part of your normal whatever that is not you won't benefit from that unless you are leaving that organization so it is really like a terminal benefit to terminate that employment relationship that's an excellent question actually thank you okay this regards to the income tax pay return schedules. Stephen Noagaba, Stephen Noagaba is saying when filing pay returns, when is schedule three and schedule four used? And how should gratuity, which is paid annually, be taxed? I repeat, when filing pay returns, when is schedule three and schedule four used? And how should gratuity, which is paid annually, be taxed? Sarah, you can respond to that. I, I may not remember the schedules per se, but what I'm saying is that whenever you have a lump sum payment, which could be either gratuity or bonus, you, you apply the schedules as and when that payment is made. But when there is no irregular payment, the law actually talks of irregular payment, then you don't have to use the other schedules, you just use the other normal schedules. Okay, uh, let me take two questions. Uh, I have one from Angela. Angela, she says, for employees who work with the United Nations, 
Should the employees file their own income tax returns when they receive salary exempt? Employees working with the United Nations, they get their salaries exempt. Should they file their own income tax return? I think this is asking about the responsibility filing tax. Is it, does it rest with the employee or with the yeah, employer? Yeah. There was an amendment actually, is it in 2017 or, or earlier, where the, 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 the UN bodies were exempted from filing those payroll returns and therefore the mandate is on those employees to file their returns. What I know is that some of the UN bodies, even embassies, the same thing. They, they don't pay you the next salary unless you show that you have actually declared the tax. I don't know whether they are trying to make you to be tax compliant, but what, what we are saying is that the planning, the responsibility to file returns rests within the individual. And remember, you can do this provisional returns and pay your tax every quarter. Every three months, you deposit that tax for three months and you pay and then you file a final return. That, that is okay. And in this case, it will be like individual income tax and not employment income per se, because employment would be vested with the employer. Okay, we have someone by the name Charity Mwebaza. Charity uh, has two questions. How long ideally should a consultancy contract be? Number one, number two, if I do not want to employ someone with benefits, that is NSSF, pay, medical, ETC, yet I want to give them above 235,000. What options would you give me? Just a minute. I, they are this other last one. The last one. If, if I, I don't, don't want to. If I do not want to, no, if I do not want to employ someone with benefits like NSSF, pay, medical, yet I want to give them above 235,000 shillings per month. What options would you give me? She's, this, so uh, if I get to charity well, she's asking how she can pay people above the threshold, but while avoiding all the related uh, <laughs> commitments, pay. Yeah, yeah. And, um, said, and so on, yeah. How long should a consultant's contract be? It can be as long as you want to have it, but what is important is the, how have you structured that contract? Because I could have a retainer-based contract, which is a consultant-based contract. Like for example, we have consultants contracts that we use to file employment returns for, for companies or, or VAT returns for companies. And we keep billing every month. And this contract can even go on for years, five years or not. What is important is the content of this contract and how it is being executed. Very, very important. Execution and how is the contract structured? Does it pick on what we were talking of? Independence relationship, integration, control, work tools, etc. That is very, very important. And then if I'm paying someone 235, but you don't want to pay tax, or you want to pay less tax, and also don't want to pay NSSF, you see NSSF, they were talking of over 16 years and less than 55 years. NSSF is based on cash emoluments. And as long as you are a private entity, an NGO, you really have to pay that NSSF. And then uh, if you don't want to pay tax, First and foremost, you are not the one paying tax. It's the individual employee going to pay this tax. We appreciate that you are the withholding agent. So if you want to structure this money so that this person doesn't pay tax, then make sure that the benefits over and above 235 will maybe be, be benefits that are exempt from tax. You give that person medical insurance, you give them life premium, you give them a gift less than 10,000 per month, those, those small, small things. But for, for tax planning around employment income, it's really limited. And uh, I, 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 I would want to imagine that 
if the person is paying is getting less, then the, the value of that person is also small. If the person is earning more, then it is fair that you share it to the government. Thank you. I'm not working for the tax authority, but I'm just a tax advisor so that we, we, we tell you the right thing so that you don't come to borrow and say, you should have told us. Okay, okay. We have someone by the name Zubaid Anamono who asks, are court awards to an employee subject to central deductions? And if any, which deductions apply? Court awards to an employee, are they subject to central deductions? And if so, which deductions apply? It, so. it really depends. Because for example, if the court award was in respect of uh, some money which was paid less and yet you should have paid or which was not paid and should have been paid, then they have to pay, pay tax on that. It is that. Remember, when I introduced this subject, we say that employment income would relate to emoluments paid for past services of employment, emoluments paid for present services of employment, or future services of employment. So if this court award relates to a payment that should have been made maybe six years back, but wasn't made because of the, the, the disagreement, and now that court has pronounced itself and said this money should have actually been paid, then it has to be paid. So it is, it is as simple as that. What, is, what are we paying? Is it employment income? Is it something incidental to services of employment? Is it in respect to past services of employment? We must ask ourselves what is actually being paid for. That is very, very important. Unless it is a sports award, like for my people from Kapchorwa, whose incomes are exempt, but anything that an employer is paying, we must really be able to sift through and look at what is the nature of this pay. And in most cases, like I would tell you, uh, if you are really somebody who wants to, to be tax, tax compliant and to ensure that you don't really have those tax risks, you can even write to the tax authority. I have this payment and uh, I need your confirmation. Does this really attract tax? Or you, you consult your tax advisor to give you some clarity on that. But... Uh, if it is in the nature of employment, it is definitely payable. Thank you. Okay, we have Rera, Rera, Patrick. He says, dear Sarah, the tax benefit on loans, is it on reducing balance? That is, depending on the amount outstanding, on the amount of the outstanding loan, or is it fixed per month throughout the year? Please comment on this. The tax benefit on Actually, loans is... Is it on reducing balance? Yeah, I've got you. I've, I've got the yeah. question. I've got yeah. the question, Chair. If, if you look at the formula, it is the loan times the difference between the statutory or BOU rate and the company rate times N over 12, where N is the number of months the loan is learning over the 12 months in a year. So it is really a straight line thing. You, you, it's not on reducing balance. It will run for the number of years that the loan will be. But it will only be prorated if the loan runs like in the first year for less than 12 months, we will use the actual period. And then in the last year, if it runs for less than 12 months. Thank you, Chair. Okay. I think maybe we take two more questions and then we will hand over to ICPAU. It's about 10 minutes to four and we are about to close. Uh, for a director, Rogers, Rogers Amutahire asks, for a director who is earning in more than one company and his pay is paid, does he need to file a return at the end of the financial year? If yes, why? Sarah? Um, a director will, will have to file a return if you, if you are earning income from different companies. Simply because uh, the tax authority will want to know if the, all the incomes have been consolidated and paid. 
usually they will file a return and no pay will be, no tax will be paid, but there will be a return consolidating all the incomes and also confirming with tax credit certificates attached that tax was paid by the respective employers, but a return will be filed. You will note that when you go asking for a tax clearing certificate, they will say this person is a director but doesn't file the return, even when the person is in the payroll. Okay. Then lastly, lastly, we have Stella Ayeto who says on local service tax in some of the guidelines, it's indicated that it should be computed on the gross after payee. Please clarify. Actually, for, for, for purposes of local service tax, we refer to the Income Tax Act because the Income Tax Act specifically indicates it as tax deductible. So uh, we are not even bothered with what the Local Government Act says, but we are looking at the Income Tax Act, which gives us the mandate to treat it as such. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we have about eight minutes to the close of our session for today. Uh, let me extend another appreciation uh, to CPA Sarah uh, Chelangat for the very able presentation and also for addressing the various questions that have been fielded. Please note that we had many more questions, but uh, because of time constraint, we are not able to address all of them. I believe that ICPAU will still provide some forum for communication in case some people have questions, they can still forward to ICPAU. And in one way or another, they will be attended to. Thank you so much. And please don't get offended if your question has not been selected. As I said, I don't put on party colors, no yellow, no red berets, no whatever. So it's a purely very random selection of questions. And uh, I can see Ambrose here smiling. Uh, I'm a fair person. So <laughs> otherwise, thanks a lot, members, uh, for attending. And I now hand you back to Ambrose uh, Mogisha of ICPAU to do concluding remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, CPA Creighton Marker. We are so grateful for chairing this uh, webinar. We thank you so much on behalf of ICPAU. We also wish to thank uh, CPA Sarah Chirangat for a wonderful presentation. It has been very enriching and we believe participants have learned a lot. Thank you, Sarah, for supporting the profession and for updating members on what they need to know, what they need to do with regard to taxation of employment income. It is pertinent that every member keeps updating his or her attitudes, knowledge, and skills with regard to what he or she does so that he or she is able to support the employer, support the client, and even the community, and then economy. So that's the purpose, the main purpose of our CPD. Uh, while drafting, we look at what happens in the needs, what should, do, what should be members uh, being in the know, and then we bring such good facilitators. We thank you, Sarah. Uh, I promise pa participants that uh, the questions which have not been asked, I have been providing them. We will forward them to Sarah, and then we shall also send them back to you. For instance, I see Stella Maris, a team, we shall send you a question, Sarah. When she responds, we shall come back to you. Joa, CPA, Joa, Butumuranze, the same. And others. So we thank you so much, participants, as well, for your time and particularly your data. And in a special way, your questions. The questions have made this webinar very highly successful. It shows that you are running, and therefore, since you are running, the presenter was also doing a good job on your mind, on your level of learning and development. I want to thank you so much for that. Our upcoming webinars are already on the screen. I, I believe you are able to see them. We have a fair value measurement webinar, IFRA 13. It is pertinent that you, under, you, you attend this webinar, and in particular in this crisis of COVID-19. 
uh, fair value measurements, what was the fair value the other time may not be fair value now. So I, I, I kind of invite you to attend this webinar. We also have another webinar on the 14th of October. It is a very highly specific to the NGO world. You may be interested to attend such. And the others. Then we have also a, a CPD program on the website. Feel interested to go there, see the, the, the program you'd want to attend, select it, book it early, and keep it in your mind. So that when time comes, you are able to attend that. Uh, we will share CPD certificates through your email addresses for the first timers on this, for this webinar. We will also share the presentation materials uh, through your emails. The video which Sarah was presenting and, the, and also involving the chair will be put on our YouTube channel. And therefore you should be able to go to the YouTube channel and watch that video and be able to respond to, uh, to uh, clarify on what you couldn't have uh, uh, picked. Otherwise, on behalf of ICPAU and in particular the CPD team I have here, we thank you so much for attending and we wish you the best uh, for your profession. Bye for now.